Okay, can we start? Yes. <laughs> Finally, can we start? Order them to start. Okay, we're we're starting. So this is a this is the first day of the day and a half workshop we have on Ottoman provincial history and historiography. Um, we have only three sessions, and today we have one, and tomorrow we have two, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And I mean, technicalities, I think I kind of failed to uh, explain and describe them beforehand. Uh, but for each paper, paper, we are thinking about like 20 to 25 minutes uh, maximum. And the uh, uh, structure will be like, we will have 10 minutes of discussion after each paper. And then at the end, when we have time, we will do yet another round of uh, questions and, and answers. I think this is the way it's going to work. Uh, I want to say a couple things, maybe just one thing about the idea behind the workshop. Uh, and then Professor uh, Abu Hussein, my uh, co coordinator, <laughs> uh, he, he will also uh, uh, tell a couple things. Uh, and, and then we will leave the floor to uh, Professor uh, John Malloy and, uh, uh, and the panel participants. The idea, I just want to say, maybe in five minutes, I kind of uh, said and wrote a couple uh, sentences last night. Uh, but t t uh, let me thank you again for uh, taking your time and coming here. Uh, it's the middle of the, uh, of the term, and I'm sure you're all swamped with a lot of commitments and, uh, and responsibilities as, as we are. And you took your time and uh, came all the way to Beirut. Uh, so we are really happy and grateful uh, for, for that. Uh, I just want to sort of take the opportunity to share a couple of simple thoughts uh, behind the event. I mean, it's been, in my mind, it's been uh, there for quite some time. Uh, but after I arrived here at AUB uh, for this year uh, and decided to teach Ottoman history classes, then it became uh, uh, more obvious and I discussed it with Professor Abu Hussein and, uh, and we decided to organize this small uh, workshop. And just uh, it was a bad planning in the beginning, we didn't know that it was a holiday. So this is the only, I guess, downside to it. Uh, if I may speak for like five minutes. To explain, is, that, is, is it's okay? <laughs> so, I was I was actually trained as an Ottoman histori historian. Uh, this is this is the first thing I want to say. But I never taught in my life uh, survey classes in Ottoman history. Okay, so this is something I did here for the first time. And when I decided to do that, the, the, the first thing I did was to go back to the uh, textbooks that I was familiar with. Uh, see if I could adapt one or two of them as, uh, as, uh, as my course, instead of compiling uh, a, a reader, uh, something that I have been doing for my economic history classes for a long time and I'm never happy with it. Uh, so the first group of books that I checked, uh, I checked out, comprised of books that are uh, wi widely used in survey classes and coincidentally authored by people that I had a chance to work with uh, throughout my career. So I looked at Suraya Faruqi's uh, book, The Ottoman Empire, A Short History, then examined late Donald Quattar's book, The Ottoman Empire, 1700 to 1922, then looked at late Norman Iskowitz's Ottoman Empire and Islamic Tradition, then late Halid Inaljik's The Ottoman Empire, The Classical Age, and then Shukri Haniolu's uh, book on the brief history of the late Ottoman Empire. Then I looked at Colin Imbert's book, The Ottoman Empire, and, uh, and Caroline Finkel's Osman's Dream, which is probably the most popular textbook nowadays. And I think all those textbooks, all those uh, books that are being widely used in survey classes, they have their special merits, for sure. And their authors definitely have contributed, contributed to the field of Ottoman studies in a variety of ways. And I think if you take some of these names out of the field, I mean, I think Ottoman history, the field would be, uh, perhaps not would be there, like Suraya and Inalji uh, particularly. And as I went through all these texts, I did something that I never did before, pro probably because I was here in Beirut and saw it sort of a necessity to adapt a more provincial-based view of Ottoman history. And uh, therefore, I sort of paid most, uh, utmost attention to the way they treated provinces in their narratives, uh, which I discovered uh, differed from one another with uh, small nuances, but in the end operated more or less around the same uh, mon monolithic, uh, simple storyline. Uh, my, for this workshop, my plan was to turn my observations regarding this uh, 
observations that I had into an article, and I couldn't, I'm, I apologize. Uh, but once, after the uh, workshop, we start compiling this volume, uh, editing the papers and, uh, and um, uh, presentations, I think I will be able to sort of uh, do that and pr probably uh, put it as, a, uh, as an introduction to the volume. Uh, I can confidently say that the way Ottoman provinces were represented in the pervasive narrative that I found in almost all these books was in fact similar to the way the Ottoman Empire was represented in the main narratives of world history or global history, something that we have been complaining about uh, for many years. They were treated marginally and referred to usually when they, uh, when they posed a threat or some kind of a challenge to the center. Then the relations between the center and the province under consideration were reduced to a continuous process of negotiation between the elites and the ups and downs of the negotiation process would be the sort of highlights of, uh, of documentation and analysis. And if you read it from the 16th century onwards, uh, it would look like as if the whole story was, uh, all, whole history was structured to tell how the local notables were waiting there to assert the, uh, their presence vis-a-vis -vis the central state in the 18th century. And if you read it, read it backward from the 19th century, then it would be like how the central state asserted its control over the local notables or failed to do so and see uh, the te those territories slipping away uh, from its control. Although all those scholars themselves produced wonderful and very detailed monographs, I have in mind particularly Surya, on provincial communities like Surya writing uh, towns and townsmen or men of modest substance, and there is, in fact, a huge scholarship. I mean, represented by also yourselves. I have in mind Cohen's book on Jerusalem, Amy Singer's book on, uh, on Palestine, Adnan Bahit's book on Damascus, Abdul Rafek's book on Damascus again, Professor Abu Hussein's book on Syria, Ronald Jennings on Cyprus, Elias's work on Crete, uh, Rosita's work on Bulgaria, uh, Nelly Hanna on Egypt, Bruce Masters, Dina Huri. I mean, you have. Jane Hathaway and all these all these names have produced wonderful, wonderful uh, monographs on the provinces. But I found it odd that the life stories or experiences of communities uh, with their elites and ordinary men and women, so vividly documented and described on those monographs, did hardly get represented in that pervasive narrative that we are provided in those main textbooks. Uh, and their presence is often reduced uh, to a few patterns only. Uh, my overall impression of this narrative is that provincial communities, be that those in the Balkans, airplanes, or in North Africa, they matter as long as they finance Istanbul, they matter as long as they feed Istanbul, they matter as long as they challenge Istanbul, yes, in the, all their institutional developments, they matter as long as they emulate and imitate Istanbul, which in fact does not square well with the, with the main trends in provincial scholarship. So against this background, I thought in the beginning that a small workshop to discuss the possibilities of integrating the provinces into the main narrative of the ministry would be great. But then Professor Abu Hussein intervened, uh, rightly, to reduce it to a more modest and workable goal, that is taking stock of the provincial scholarship while bringing uh, together histories of different provincial communities. And this is the reason why we are here. And my impression from the titles and abstracts that we received from you uh, at least on paper, we have achieved that, it seems. So in, I hope that in those three panels that we're going to have, uh, we will put the different uh, territories and communities of the empire in a uh, dynamic and very close dialogue and, uh, and see what comes next. So I'd like to welcome you all again. And I hope the concept uh, is, is not so, too bad. And it can sort of provide us with a platform on which to sort of work together and come up with better ideas. Thank you for coming. <laughs> now I'd like to leave the floor to Professor Abu Hussein, uh, who is the who is professor in history department, history, history and archaeology department, and also the director of Center for Arts and Humanities. We work together to organize the workshop. Thank you, Professor. Uh, you, you want to sit here or there? Doesn't matter. Uh, good afternoon, uh, and uh, though uh, my colleague Yild, Honor Yildirim has 
already done the honors of welcoming you. I'd like to welcome you again uh, on behalf of the Center for Arts and Humanities. As a matter of fact, uh, his, uh, him being Hildrim, he did deserve my place. I was supposed to speak first, <laughs> but true to his name, he, <laughs> I am like he jumped on it. <laughs> Uh, there is no way to stop children. <laughs> uh, anyway, before I begin uh, my sort of formal speech, I would like to thank uh, Professor Yildirim actually for organizing this workshop, for doing much of the work of organizing and inviting people. Uh, but I would like also to thank uh, my staff at the Center for Arts and Humanities, who actually did the sort of uh, hard work for it, uh, namely Ms. Rita Basil, who is not with us today on account of her mother's being in hospital, and uh, Batul Faqih. Where is Batul? Uh, yeah, she deserves a great Batul, uh, I would like you to applaud Batul. Batul is working very hard. Uh, thank you very much, Batul. And now I, I will speak to you seriously, more seriously. Uh, uh, actually, the, the occasion and the time limits, because again, uh, my <coughs> colleague uh, Onur took away some of the time, sorry, uh, as well as my competence or lack of competence thereof, uh, would not allow for a comprehensive or an in-depth review of the state of Ottoman studies in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. uh, also, my remarks will be primarily limited to what is written in Arabic in the Arab East and will not touch on the writing on the subject in the Maghrib. Hence, the following remarks are meant as a starter to a more substantial meal, hopefully, uh, that's being your more profound discussions today and tomorrow. Uh, as you know, perhaps uh, some 50 years ago, it was easy to dismiss the whole Arab, the whole record of, Ottoman, of the Ottoman period in the Arab world as being <coughs> simply the Asr al-Inhitaat, or the age of decadence, with little or nothing in it worthy of further examination. We know otherwise today. Today there is a growing number of studies in the published works as, and research projects, as in theses and dissertations, that deals with one aspect or another of the Ottoman period in the Arab world without this ideological <coughs> predisposition. This point of departure was necessary for Arab historians to start the attempt of coming to grips with or better understand the long Arab Ottoman past. Uh, this is necessary to provide a more solid basis for those interested in the question of Arab-Turkish present and future relations. Such relations are better built when they are based on proper <coughs> historical understanding rather than history written on the basis of ideology and stereotypes. Another ideological position was that which idealized the Ottoman state as an Islamic state and interpreted Ottoman history accordingly, thus reducing this history to an uninterrupted chain of conspiracies against the Ottoman state leading to its demise. Arab historians, some Arab historians, as well as some Turkish historians, I'm not sure how numerous or few they are, <coughs> continue to use these two ideological positions as their starting points in studying their Ottoman past. But fortunately, many have long abandoned them. There is currently a growing trend among Ottomanists in general and Arab Ottomanists in particular to romanticize the Ottoman state and look backwards to a presumed golden age of the bygone Ottoman Commonwealth and the Ottoman plural 
multicultural and multi-religious society. This is especially poignant given our current situation. But even when Arab historical writing on the Arab Ottoman past is free from these ideological biases, it continues to suffer from serious shortcomings. A major part of these shortcomings may be attributed to the fact that most Arab historians work in isolation. By isolation, I mean the following. <coughs> Until recently, Arabs worked on their Ottoman past without reference to Ottoman archival materials or to studies written on the Arab provinces in Turkish. Thus, they did lack a very important source and their studies were methodologically flawed. But even after some Arab historians started to use archival material, they did so with such a fascination with the documents that made the document almost a sacred text and the archives the fountain of all knowledge, which is unquestionable. Uh, in uh, Quranic terms, لا يأتيه الباطل من بين يديه ولا من خلفه تنزيل من حكيم حميد Without much understanding of the nature of such documents or the state machinery that produced them and without reading them in conjunction with Arab and other sources. Arab historians are not the only guilty group of what Khalil Berktay called document fetishism. Needless to say, that such an approach to documentary sources is almost as deficient as ignoring such a source. Still in the question of isolation, Arab historians by and large continue to work with very little or no reference to the growing literature on the Ottoman state outside the Arab world. They generally work with their own sources. While this tendency among Arab Ottomanists has its advantages, in that it did introduce very important authentic indigenous sources since each generation found itself compelled to find new sources or to reinterpret, to reinterpret the old sources in a new light, it nevertheless precludes any effort toward a comparative approach within and without the Ottoman context. We know very little, at least as evidence of our publication suggests, for example, about the experience of other people under Ottoman rule. Also, our studies tend to pay no attention to comparative analysis within the Ottoman realm as between Balkan, Anatolian, and Arab provinces or between imperial systems or with early modern societies. Further still, and despite the fact that we have some excellent monographic studies on Arab provinces, cities, nahiyas, kazas, and even single villages, we have not moved beyond this stage to be part of the growing theoretical discussion on Ottoman history in general and Arab history under the Ottomans in particular. One experiment which broke away from this chosen or enforced isolation was the bold and almost purely personal initiative which a Tunisian uh, colleague and friend, Professor Abdul Jalil Tamimi, took some 30 or 40 years ago. The center he established and its publications, notably the Arab Historical Review for Ottoman Studies and the regular conferences it organized on the Arab provinces aimed at providing a forum of exchange between Arab Ottomanists and their Turkish and Western counterparts. These activities have, to a limited extent, managed to make known and available some of the Arabic historical literature on the Ottoman past and to non-Arabs and maybe to a lesser extent vice versa. We need more initiatives of this type, but for such an initiative to be sustainable, it needs to be institutionalized. Professor Tamimi's very important experiment has all but folded up. Hopefully, this small workshop will be the beginning of a discussion among us as individuals and among our institutions towards further sustainable collaboration, which will make it possible for us in time to be influential in the direction that historical scholarship on our Ottoman past will take.
Thank you very much. Now we can leave the floor to Professor John Meloy and the panel. And Professor Deringo. Mark. Okay, I'll start. Uh, we can kind of start since our introducers uh, took more time than they were supposed to, but, but they're forgiven for that. Um, this, I'm speaking as a Mamluk historian, uh, ever ever embittered. Um, the, uh, the so the first session uh, includes three papers. Uh, I'll keep the the intros. Uh, to a minimum, just to maximize time for the papers themselves and discussion. So our first speaker is Mark Imus, who's a permanent research fellow at the CNRS in Paris, where he's the director of the Center for Turkish, Ottoman, Balkan, and Central Asia, Asiatic Studies. Um, his paper is entitled, Is Provincial History Written from the Provinces? So without further ado, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you all for being here and for this kind invitation to speak before you. So uh, I'll try and stick the, the schedule. Um, <clears throat> well, at first, uh, when, when he contacted me, Onur uh, kindly suggested that uh, th there would be a need for uh, drawing some kind of sketchy state of the field uh, about Ottoman uh, history of the provinces or the history of the Ottoman provinces. And I found it was a, a very kind and, and actually uh, optimistic suggestion, optimistic to, 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 to suggest it to me at least. Uh, uh, all in all, I figured out I had no, no, I could have no pretension and no mastery, sufficient mastery to, to do that. So what follows is a kind of a a more personal roadmap to see uh, uh, how it reflects uh, the field uh, through through uh, some parts of my, of my work, and I think uh, uh, I hope doing so to, to provide uh, features for for further discussion. So, as uh, some of you may know, uh, my work once focused on uh, one Ottoman province in particular, which was Cyprus which I strove to apprehend uh, within the time frame of some kind of a short 19th century time frame, that is to say the 1820s to the 1870s. And what I tried to do uh, was to unravel the, some of the relationships between local particulars and regional or even more global dynamics of empire, trade and social change at the, at the time. This, one could reckon, uh, is what writing history from a province means. Now, does that amount to writing a provincial history of the Ottoman Empire is the kind of question I, I would like to ask. Uh, speaking of a provincial history of the Ottoman Empire uh, entails a more synthetic uh, kind of vision which revolves around a shift from the provinces in the plural as a multiplicity of localities subsumed under certain tools of rule, a shift from this plural to the province in the singular, something that connotes a mode of conduct or a structural figure. This, uh, this is what one may call a case for provincialization of Ottoman history, which also has to do with the following question put in very general terms how to avoid converting a field uh, uh, of inquiry, 
in my case it was Cyprus at the time, into an area of specialized knowledge. For instance, if you read some works uh, done by, by uh, historians about Cyprus from the 1960s onwards, uh, you could feel how there is this sense of considering Cyprus as the home of a specific local knowledge of a kind, which changes the Ottoman history of Cyprus into a Cypriot history of the Ottoman Empire, in a way. And that's some, what some of uh, these historians or, or, or scholars in general could call Cypriology, with a, with, a, with a name to defining it even as a new field or as a new discipline, even. So this is what could be behind the, 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 the provincialization catchword. Also, one may assume uh, this has to do with the now famous uh, alternative between history in and history of, which has been especially popularized by uh, Horden and Purcell's book, uh, The Corrupting Sea. So they were, they were speaking of the Mediterranean. But here one could also think of the problem as a problem of whether one writes the history in the Ottoman Empire and the history of the Ottoman Empire. Now, speaking of the province in the singular, as I, I try to, to emphasize, uh, could be uh, uh, something that entails a work, a pre preliminary work on semantics. Since whether one uses uh, English, French, or other uh, languages of scholarship, I, there is a strong uh, tendency in the word province to, to, to contain and maintain derogatory overtones. In comparison to feverish metropolitan existence, the province, or anything provincial, equates to boredom. Life is minuscule, prosaic, given over to a dull ordinariness, deprived of style. Nothing ever happens there, which basically amounts to saying that the province has no history in and of itself. So the preliminary question is whether these semantics, these uh, overtones, would apply to the Ottoman context and semantics. An answer would be yes, definitely so. For sure, if one studies Ottoman parlance, at least for the period I, I, I have been focusing on the 19th century uh, closely, the Ottoman uh, notions of uh, the province uh, firstly come up as uh, administrative notions, such as Eyalet, then Vilayet, so the province is an administrative district. Then it is also by extension a dominion, the Memleket, over which a sovereign exercises authority. But Ways of belonging also come into play since Memleket already denotes the notion of homeland, uh, even nowadays uh, in Turkish. Now, besides this, there are also uh, meaning, meanings of the word uh, province that, endow, that are endowed uh, with notions of how mannered you are, uh, what kind of language you use. And that also identifies uh, provincials. The province then has backward manners and clumsy speech. And this is no longer a yalet or vilayet, this is more about tashra in uh, Ottoman Turkish. A word which is a variant of tushru, tushru, uh, which has uh, the notion of what is exterior, what is on the outside, as its uh, preliminary uh, first meaning. So, in Ottoman Turkish, as in other languages, the province reveals and contains some kind of common uh, semantic uh, uh, background, uh, and it is, one may say, underpinned by the same uh, thought pattern. You have uh, this kind of dichotomy between the provinces, again, that is localities subsumed under certain tools of rule, on the one hand, and on a more structural uh, take on what the province is, which is uh, related to this meaning of Tashra, which has, which has been uh, emphasized. So, uh, a possible method uh, to uh, flesh out more concretely uh, the case for provincialization, which, uh, which uh, I made, uh, a possible method, a possible path, could be to single out profiles and trajectories of certain individuals that have been uh, moving and circulating uh, at various scales within the empire. And this is what I, I 
very much did uh, uh, in, in, the, in the work in Cyprus. For instance, I use this case study just, just as a reminder uh, of this man, once a governor of Cyprus, but who actually could be defined both as an Ottoman turned provincial and also as a provincial turned Ottoman. So here, just as a, as a snapshot, I, I, I just put this quote by uh, uh, Lorenzo Warner Pease, the American missionary who visited Cyprus in, in, in the mid 1830s. Uh, when he wrote this short biographical notice on the man, uh, and here this is, this is uh, the, the edition of his uh, journal by, uh, by Rita Severis, and actually all the inquiry, all the investigation work I could do using Ottoman or, or consular archives from the same period pretty much uh, confirmed this kind of a, a, a portrait. So what it shows if one, if, if one quickly reads it, uh, is that this man, being a native of Syria, uh, then uh, had ties to several different milieus and several uh, locales as well, uh, and has not only political or administrative uh, duties, but also very strongly was uh, related to uh, trade and to uh, tax farming kind of uh, activities and that his uh, finances, his financial portfolio was not only related to uh, the, the region around Aleppo or around Cyprus, but also to uh, different kind of investment or money lending patterns involving Istanbul and, and other places. So uh, what can become more uh, precisely understandable when studying such profiles is that uh, uh, being an Ottoman uh, provincial is not simply about administrative duties and compromises, but it also has to do with many other registers of social relations, other experiences or other expectations. One may then keep in mind this idea uh, of diverse schedules of concerns, to quote Amy Singer here. And we have a large diversity of concerns, and within this diversity, intersection of concerns does not amount to congruence of these concerns. So we should keep and maintain the sense of a certain ambivalence in the portraits that we can draw of people like Mehmet A, uh, which in fact is part of what one may call the provincial aspect of uh, this trajectory. This provincial aspect confirms the need to do away with some kind of dichotomies such as uh, central or local, central and peripheral, uh, and use other kind of tools to understand them in a better way. Now, this amounts to a personification of history, doing just what I did, what I, what I record uh, uh, I did. This personification of history has clearly its merits, but it is also not without risks. Clearly, this kind of profiling uh, takes its cue from what sociologists would call methodological individualism. That is to say, the assumption that individual situations and trajectories best help not only to describe, but also, more importantly, to explain sociopolitical dynamics on a larger scale. Maybe we could de debate about how much methodological individualism has become commonplace in historical scholarship over the past two decades or so. I think we all could agree, though, that this tense amounts to letting individuals outnumber uh, collectives in our understanding of history at large. Besides, reliance on individual protagonists requires a trust in biography as a method, which, on a more philosophical note, makes it incumbent on biographers to decide on how to identify oneself to begin with. Actually, there is no reason why the writing of a provincial history of the Ottoman Empire should solely rely on such premises. Previously, I suggested that the province could be approached both as a mode of conduct and as a structural figure, Neither conducts nor structures take their shape from individual features only. 
For instance, institutional devices may do the trick as well. I will just put one example here of such a possible approach on a more institutional level, let's say, which is about money. And especially when I studied uh, documents about uh, how uh, the Ottomans uh, handled the circulation of promissory notes of the Kaimate that they put into circulation starting in the early 1840s, and especially about the concern they had that these notes, this kind of bank notes of a kind, could be easily subject to uh, forgery or falsification. So let me quote here uh, a quick excerpt from this memo by the Minister of Finance of the time in the early 1840s. In truth, the, state in, uh, the trade in promissory notes uh, on state borrowing causes mighty inconvenience in the districts of the province, where the population find it hard to distinguish originals from copies and where the greatest harm ensues for some of the humblest. That is why it is imperative that both printed and handwritten promissory notes no longer be used as money except at the threshold of felicity, that is, the very core of the Istanbul uh, city, where payments due at fixed rate dates shall be honored as hitherto. In the provinces, these notes shall totally cease to have any value whatsoever in three months' time. Everyone shall promptly exchange any promissory notes against state borrowing uh, or on state borrowing in their possession and acquire no more of them henceforth. At the expiry of the allotted period, there shall be worth absolutely nothing. This one shows you uh, part of what I've just translated, uh, translated uh, in, in Ottoman Turkish. And then I'm also kind of comparing it to another document which I, I haven't studied myself, but uh, uh, which uh, is quoted in uh, one of Ali Akhildi's uh, works on, on Kai Mays, which is an excerpt of the 1923 uh, Journal of General Correspondence, the Muharrirat Yomumiye Mejmoasi of the Ottoman Ministry of Finance. And again, it's about forged banknotes, but just several decades afterwards. Uh, admittedly, uh, the way I worked on Achilles' book makes it uh, difficult uh, to distinguish clearly between his views and paraphrase, paraphrase his making from the Ottoman correspondent itself. But still, it provides uh, some food for further thought. Because the notes in question, the banknotes, the forged banknotes from the 1920s that actually this spotted, uh, he stresses they have been circulating between uh, Aranya and Antalya, so somewhere in the south of Anatolia. And according to him and or according to the Ministry of Finance officials at the time, they could be considered to be of provincial fabrication. That is to say, he explains, necessarily cruder and more strewn with errors that if produced in Istanbul or some other great urban center. As he writes, they are crudely confected, they present material defects uh, in a great number. So, again, as I said, there is a kind of a level of uh, uh, difficulty to distinguish between what is a commentary he's doing and what is a paraphrase here. But what is at play is that one can follow uh, throughout several decades a certain uh, uh, rather rudimentary uh, anthropology of provincial stupor, that is, the, the, the inability of provincial to deal with certain things supposed to be more complex, certain uh, abilities to, to, to distinguish, for instance, uh, between the originals and the copies and so on which also, uh, of course, highlights a certain stigmatization of provincials, a well-known trope uh, even today. What is important is this stigmatization is not about the locals themselves, it's about the relationship that is built between different protagonists at different levels in, in various places and positions. And so it involves uh, the Minister of Finance that I quoted here, in, in his relation to the provincials, or to what, what, what he, he, he calls uh, um, the, the districts of the province. But it also involves, as my example with Ali Akhildi's uh, uh, 
just on a very, uh, uh, in a very uh, ingenious way, also may highlight, it also involves the perpetuation of certain tropes in history writing about uh, uh, the Ottoman provinces uh, even today. The way we as uh, scholars will tend to interpret certain discourses uh, circulating from one document to the other. So, and finally, what is important about this uh, stigmatization, about what I, I, I termed an anthropology of provincial stupor, is that it's not only about culture, it's not only about the way of seeing others, for instance. It's also entailing a very concrete pattern of governmental practice and organization. That is to say, the institutional device of the promissory note, of the money or of then the paper money that is to be developed throughout the empire is also very much shaped and patterned by a certain understanding of what the provincials are or are not able uh, of doing. Uh, so, as a, a very short conclusion, I don't know, it <coughs> need to be very short. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I would go back uh, to what may be uh, suggested as four theses on provincial history that uh, crisscross the, all, all the, the, the explanation, the comments on documents that I've been doing so far. One is that uh, what one could call the province in the singular is not only some given physical place, that it has, it has to do with frontiers that are based on symbolic more than on natural uh, topographies, uh, that has been illustrated also by the, the anthropology of stupor, which I, I highlighted uh, a few minutes ago. Another one is uh, to stress how provincial history uh, can be uh, uh, reduced to the work of writing monographs uh, in history writing. That is to say that provincial history is not a task of writing the history of a particular locality, uh, even uh, in its uh, relation to, to other localities, but rather to use uh, a certain locus of research as a laboratory to understand in a more ideal, typical way how the Ottoman province in general uh, functioned at a given period. And here, that means that the idea of the province or the ideal type of the province doesn't so much refer to a place than it does to a relationship or to a complex a set of relationships which, as I, I said, speaking of uh, Mehmet R. earlier, relationships that do not need to be uh, congruent with one another and systematic e either. So designating one's research locus as provincial signifies that it is uh, uh, crisscrossed by multiple networks and frameworks of knowledge and power, uh, which lead us to uh, come to grips with several uh, different patterns of understanding. And again, this takes out an essential difference with so-called local history in so much uh, as uh, rather than dealing with a microcosm, we are dealing with kaleidoscopic scales. So this is the fourth thesis, one may say, uh, namely that one of the essential problems with provincial history is that of the variation of scales which points to the need to free oneself of the influence of very general trends, already known uh, uh, patterns of understanding. Uh, for instance, there is no guarantee that we will be able to understand provincial relationships uh, in their uh, complex social cultural realities solely by applying the models that one could derive uh, from the larger scale of the Ottoman Empire or the Mediterranean or a larger continental scale as a whole. Nor should we expect microbiographical accounts of individual lives to be of sufficient insight. So, maybe this thesis may help us uh, uh, make the province and provincial history a crucible for interrogating the models that have been applied to Near Eastern history and present-day Mediterranean Europe uh, in the next few years and decades. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. We have um, 
10 or 15 minutes, I think, for questions. Uh, yes? Thank you. I would like to congratulate uh, Mark. I believe that this was an excellent introduction to the problematic mm -hmm. that started to describe for this uh, conference. Uh, I can understand why you are uh, suggesting that we should go from a history of the provinces to the history of the uh, uh, province. However, I was just thinking that this might be the, the, how somebody who works on the 19th century Ottoman Empire would see things when the Ottoman Empire tries to, to make a provincial administration far more organized and different than the centuries before. For the previous centuries, I would suggest that the plural is okay. Provinces, history of the provinces. Uh, if you go back to the provincial canunames of the 15th and the 16th century, they, that is from the, the very beginning of, mm. let's say, late medieval Ottoman uh, Empire, you see that every text is reflecting the local uh, rules. The, the, there is some effort from Suleiman the Magnificent to, 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 to make something more, more like a general administration, but still it is very back, uh, very, very, uh, uh, very, it is very much uh, the, the, the local uh, medieval, let's say, the, 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 Serbia, Greece, and uh, elsewhere. Uh, so that is my question for discussion. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, Ilias. Um, well, the point about the scales, which I, I very quickly highlighted at the end, uh, also latching on to the one about uh, this, uh, this specific guy and others' uh, profiles of people like Mehmet are as well, could be that uh, the, the Ottoman system of rule is not necessarily more systematic for all its claim to be more centralized, whether effective or not, it's not necessarily more systematic at the period I've been speaking about, the 19th century or the 20th century, than it used to be earlier. I would rather tend to think that the kind of uh, philosophy of the Kanunames, which you, which you mentioned, was pretty much still in force, even in the 19th century, uh, provincial administration, that is to say the administration of relations between different levels of rule, not the uh, administration of one specific place. The general philosophy, so actually, I mean, that's what many historians called uh, pragmatism, which is uh, maybe not very much uh, satisfactory because you replace one word with another and you end up not explaining much. But okay, pragmatism could be an umbrella term to express this kind of philosophy of rule which actually was very much in force maybe, uh, uh, and yes, I mean, one can, one can see through the study of canon armies, which uh, people uh, like you did, and like Gilles Van Stan and Benjamin Arbel did for Cyprus, for instance, uh, this, this kind of pragmatic uh, philosophy is very much uh, prevailing in, in the, and, and Amy Singer's argument is, is very much close to that. So I'm not sure, uh, considering the 19th century as a shift from pragmatism in that sense is uh, absolutely uh, vindicated or has been vindicated so far. That, that, that's in, in this direction that I, I, I would like maybe to, to investigate further. So, I mean... <coughs> or imperial. Right. Hmm. Not nation. Hmm. Yeah. I just, I just 
have a simple question, Mark. I mean, through this angle, through this prism that you're providing us this for thesis, how are we, how can we proceed to rewrite the narrative that we, we've been complaining about? I don't know about rewriting, uh, but but, but the, the, I mean we, we heard about document fetishism uh, earlier, and I think actually 19th century. I mean, if we're speaking of 19th century as such, 19th century Ottoman historians are way, uh, uh, I mean, not even close to document fetishism. Uh, that are there are many. What I mean is that document fetishism is just a kind of a of a general statement, but what, what I mean is that given the, 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 the diversity of documentations, I think and that, 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 that certainly will be uh, illustrated even better than I could do, but the, given the diversity of documentation, there is a certain feeling that maybe we still know uh, so little about the, 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 the complex uh, amounts of information that archives themselves may help us grasp you know, and analyze. So it's even before we we, we start writing, <laughs> the problem is about reading and rereading. You know, mm. I guess I guess that would be my, my kind of uh, first first answer to that. Okay. Tyler. Yeah, uh, just the, I guess the issue of you know the protagonist is right. You know the issues I guess of like the I guess the individualization of history and dealing with the issue of you know protagonism. Dealing, with, especially with like Lebanese history, especially World War One, is a major issue because everyone has a role to play with the Ottomans. How do we orient this sort of history of the provinces? Um, from the Ottoman perspective, oftentimes you have the Ottoman state itself as a sort of kind of implied protagonist, whereas in many provincial histories you have sort of implied sort of local histories and sort of local areas as a sort of implied protagonists. How do we write a history that deals with this sort of inherent tension? Uh, at least in how it's been portrayed in many, like, say, Lebanese Syrian histories. Um, how do we come to terms with that? I, I guess that the, 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 what, one important thing is not to try and, and solve the tensions that yeah. one, one, I mean, it's very basic to, to, to make such a statement, but I, I can't think of, a, <laughs> of another one. There are, I mean, some some people have been actually uh, doing this, uh, you know, uh, kind of showing the diversity of sources without attempting to to to, to put them under the same uh, uh, pattern of understanding. So sh showing how I'm not speaking of uh, protagonists uh, or people who wrote the, the documents being like enemies or rivals. But even the, the ways of understanding the, the different sources are not, for instance, I mentioned consular sources and Ottoman sources. Uh, well, even for just a tiny lo locality such as Cyprus, uh, one could reasonably expect that these people speak of the same things. Yeah. I mean, there are so little to, to describe and so little that seems to them interesting that they speak of the same thing. And, and still, when one, when one comes to reading them very closely, when, when Seems like we're speaking of two different kind of worlds, yeah. and then we need to, to be to be then uh, harnessing different uh, patterns of reading to 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 understand what exactly is that this archive or that archive is providing us with. Otherwise, it's just about uh, speaking of the point of view or the bias. Okay, everybody agrees that all the archives are biased, but 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 then what kind of pattern of, of positive value can we add to this so as to make these archives useful? At, even at a very positivistic level, you know, how, how can we still find a way to make them provide us with, if not information, at least understanding, or, uh, you know, grasp something. Yeah. So the tensions actually are also located at this level of, of the, the, the different kinds of uh, reasoning that we use when dealing with different uh, sources. And, and one source is not necessarily allotted to one kind of reasoning and another to another kind, of course. It's, it's, com it's a complex kind of geography. <coughs> I don't know if uh, <laughs> this is close to an answer, but... Uh, I think there's time for one more question. Uh, 
thank you. It was very enlightening. And uh, I was stuck on this provincial stupor uh, imagery. <laughs> and I was comparing it to the, your example of Mamedra and asking the question of uh, really, was, uh, although there is this Tashra image, uh, actually there are so many examples of people who have come from the provinces and then return to the provinces or different provinces. And Mamedra is, in your case, also one of them. Mm. So, how integrated was the empire really? And was it I mean, just the provinces and the capital was it really separated that much, or was there really some interaction? I mean, how much it was? What was the degree of this of coming uh, from the provinces and becoming leaders of the empire? This is the question. This mm. provincial stupor idea and leaders from the provinces you know, coming from. Mm. Well, I think I mean. I, I, I did it like on purpose, like putting together different e elements which uh, do not necessarily add up to one another <laughs> into into a final image. So the, the two aspects of studying the protagonists, such as Mehmet, are and studying uh, and, and kind of tracking uh, elements of of the, the the how the Ottoman institutions think, uh, which I did in the second part, are not necessarily you know. Uh, <coughs> cannot be brought to, 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 to one single image. But the thing is, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, Mehmet Az is maybe peculiar uh, in, in very ways, in many ways. So you have the idea of a strong <coughs> integration. You have the idea of the, you know, that's also what uh, all this historiography about the politics of notables uh, uh, brought us to, to, to study. And, and, and this has been uh, an ongoing study. You can think of Hurani back in the 60s, and you can think of people like Johan Busso, uh, what he did on, on, uh, on Hamid in Palestine, as a kind of uh, transformation of the, of the idea of the notables. But all this means something very integrative. But uh, then the point is about how systematic it is. Is there a system of, of uh, social uh, organization at play and how and what kind of sources can provide us with consistent information. So maybe some ways of the prosopographical uh, study would help. Uh, so this would leave us to, to yet another, another way of studying these individuals, but on, like collective biography, as people say. It's still the idea of a biography, but it's collective. So it's kind of a compromise. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there, there would be many methods. I, I have no pretension to, to sum it all up, you know. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I like very much your comment about rereading, having to reread. The documents aren't going to just tell us what they have to tell us, but we're going to have to figure out <coughs> how to get something from them. Um, okay, the next paper by uh, Nader Ozbek, uh, who's a professor in uh, the Ataturk Institute for Modern Turkish History at Boazici University. Uh, he'll be speaking on taxation and politics at the margins of empire, a stateless approach to Ottoman fiscal history, 1839 to 1908. Actually, I would like to thank uh, the organizers of this workshop uh, and inviting me uh, to this very important uh, academic event. I'm enjoying the academic part of life here, and also I'm going to enjoy the social life in Beirut uh, in a couple of days now. Uh, actually, uh, I'm, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult to call, uh, define my doing, the way that I'm doing history is not a, a provincial history. I'm uh, doing the last 10 or more years, I mean, I've been working on fiscal issues, tax collection, uh, the institutions and pra administrative practices of uh, taxation, which is all about uh, the central state to, to a greater extent. So this is a great challenge for me to rethink on what I've been doing regarding the taxation. Uh, actually, I've written a lot uh, in pieces, uh, not in an extensive and a systematic way on tax collection practices in different uh, parts of the empire, mostly in eastern provinces, the, the eastern Anatolia, the Armenian and Kurdish provinces, and uh, very little on uh, the Romanian, the Balkan provinces of the empire. So right now uh, I'm trying to uh, rethink, reformulate what I've been doing and trying to uh, translate my uh, conceptual and theoretical uh, concerns to the language of, to the, to the agenda of this, uh, this workshop. 
actually, well, actually, I'm not good at uh, using uh, presentation software, PowerPoint, and uh, Prezi. Uh, I, I work a lot to prepare a presentation just to grab your attention because I thought that my, uh, the content of my presentation may not be very much interesting, so I'm going to play with this moving images, moving uh, slides to grab your attention. Okay? Uh, That's experiment. This is, this is an experiment for me too, okay? Uh, anyway, well, as Onur and uh, in, in, the, in the introduction part, you have summarized uh, since uh, Albert Morani's famous uh, article, Ottoman provincial historians uh, did a lot of work uh, in uh, focusing on different parts of the empire. They uh, provide us a lot of information on the social and political and also fiscal dimensions of life in the provinces. Uh, I'm not going to uh, provide a, 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 a picture of that, uh, that li literature, but for example, during the past couple of years, uh, some, some of them are our students right now, our uh, colleagues in uh, Boaz University, and I'm just, uh, in, I have in mind uh, Tolga Jora's uh, book, uh, The Ottoman East, uh, some of the Ottoman historians are complaining about the fact that what we mean by provinces, mostly the, uh, the Arab provinces, the Balkan provinces, that nobody is talking about the Kurdish provinces, the Armenian provinces. Whenever they talk about Armenian or Kurdish provinces, they are talking about mostly and specifically about the Armenian problem or the Kurdish problem. So they are spending a lot of time to incorporate the history of Eastern and all Eastern provinces into the broader picture of Ottoman history. I am just trying to mention this aspect of provincial history. Well, in this presentation, uh, I'm going to talk mostly on conceptual and historiographical part of my, uh, my paper. And the research part, I'm, uh, at the end of my presentation, I'll give you a brief uh, outline of what I'm going in terms of doing the research for this specific paper that I'm preparing for this uh, workshop. And uh, I would like to emphasize, as you see, I cannot uh, synchronize my presentation here because I'm not good at uh, Well, uh, the, I mean, anyway, forget about the presentation. Let's uh, go to the big picture, okay, the imperial picture, okay. Uh, forget about the uh, provinces slides. Uh, anyway, I mean, well, I would like to emphasize the contemporary conditions of global capitalism, our very condition, uh, the, 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 which the structural uh, transformation of global ca capitalism, which is informing our way of do doing history, our defining the space, our define the way of our, I mean, defining space, spatial temporal relationships, changing space, expansion of space, the meaning of border, the mobility of uh, people, commodities. So what, what I'm trying to say is, I mean, the space is expanding, and uh, the early modernist Ottoman historians are uh, doing a lot of work on, to, uh, on how to redefine this, the very space that they are uh, trying to expand, and the, the, they are benefiting a lot from, for example, recently, uh, Marshall Hassan's uh, conception of world history, and also the term, his, his terminologies. I have in mind uh, Marshall Hassan's Islamicate Ecumen, for example, and the problem here is, for me at least, I mean, the, 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 the most of the early, there are a lot of exceptions, obviously, most of the early modern historians are Ottomans, are paying more attention to cultural issues, symbolic issues. Uh, so uh, today we are, I'm, I'm going to emphasize the social, economic, fiscal, structural redefinition of the space. So I'm just, uh, I will just mention it. Well, during the last, Ten years, I've published uh, both in Turkish and to some extent in English uh, a couple of articles and a book uh, on uh, taxation. Redefining uh, uh, provincial history, redefining the space, time and space relationship in Ottoman history in the field of fiscal history is more difficult, as I already mentioned, uh, because taxation is all about as part of at least uh, the organization of central state. It has been uh, studied as part of the formation of modern, modern centralized state. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to uh, challenge that concentration, that focus, that obsession to some extent, if you will, that obsession with the central state. So my proposal is, let me put it from the very beginning, I, I am trying to find ways of doing Ottoman history, both uh, imperial and local, without using the concept, without referring to the conception of a state. So my title is doing Ottoman history, a stateless uh, history of Ottoman, 
I stayed the set for a sort of fiscal history. But in my first major article on taxation, I have spent a lot of time and benefited a lot from anthropological theories, uh, and I focused on the everyday practices of tax collection. Okay, so my emphasis on the everyday tax collection as a means of understanding what's going on uh, on that very specific spatial temporal uh, moment. So a spatial temporal moment is very important for me. So by avoiding states, and emphasizing the uh, different, the particular, in, a, in, a, in any of the locations, uh, I'm trying to conceptualize that uh, relationship as uh, dispositions of the autumn fiscal political system, uh, different uh, forms, particularities, so without using, I mean, uh, in, in, in a way, some assumption of that fiscal political relationship. I, I mean, I, I'm aware of the fact that all these concepts are very abstract, but I will, I'm trying to define an autonomous fiscal political system for 19th century, and every individual uh, moment, the tax collection in a village, for example, which includes the very uh, essence of that uh, global, broader, total autonomous fiscal political system. This way is a, uh, is a way of avoiding the binary relationship between center, periphery, uh, or uh, the dichotomous relation between center and province. Okay, so the, one way of avoiding that dichotomy is totally abandoning the conception of state, and instead of that focusing on uh, everyday practices, political pre pol politics at the everyday realm, and trying to understand there's an assumption of the total system, or over determination of the, uh, of the more general uh, uh, total or global system. Uh, in my second article, in my recent article, actually, I, 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 I try to explain, analyze uh, a, a, a central institution, a public finance institution of the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century, especially in the second part of the 19th century. And I, I mean, there is a paradox here because I shifted from the everyday practices to a central institution of the, the 19th century Ottoman state. But in that article, even in that article, I tried to show that even all those seemingly centralized institutions, public finance institutions, management of taxation, for example, are in fact the turning points of that institutions, the evolution of that institutions, are in fact determined by the very everyday uh, political life in different parts of them. I am trying to avoid problems, so I'm, uh, I mean, so uh, in my article, I uh, provide some uh, specific cases from different parts of the empire to explain every specific introduction of new uh, taxation laws and regulations, so the, the, the interconnectedness of those central, seemingly central uh, introductions of new tax collection to the actual uh, everyday political life in the provinces. So I'm not going to give you detail here, unfortunately. And uh, for example, I mean, we, should, we have to avoid for such an understanding of uh, a new way of understanding the, uh, the central, the, the provincial history, uh, I mean, we have to avoid public and private, the dichotomy relation between public and private, and also, uh, I mean, because the conception of modern states from its very definition uh, presumes uh, a divide between public and private, uh, central and local, uh, general and uh, specific, uh, sociological and anthropological. So the, pro the problem is, what I'm trying to say is, propose is, we have to avoid, we have, we'll, we have to find ways of avoiding all those type of dichotom conceptual dichotomies. This is my proposition. Well, I mean, uh, the overcoming center-periphery uh, dichotomy in fiscal historiography is even more difficult. Uh, I'm repeating this a couple of times. And uh, I'm, I'll here just mention uh, Dina Huri's book on Musul and uh, Ariel Salzman's uh, very important article on uh, fiscal issues, uh, which, which was published in the early 1990s, in 1993. Uh, Ancien Regime Revisited. Uh, I'm, I'm mentioning Dina Huri because she, uh, one of her articles on Central Province relationship has been included by Surya Faruqi in the, uh, in the third volume of Cambridge. His history of Turkey. So she is providing a historiographical overview and summarizing the achievements of this literature. And uh, the problem, I mean, for both of them is, from my perspective, 
transition from 18th century fiscal system to 19th century. For both of the 18th century fiscal systems, a uh, uh, decentralized, uh, distributed uh, fiscal political system. And for both of them, the transition from late 19th, 18th century to early 19th century and then throughout the 19th centuries, for example, for Dina Huri, it is uh, autonomization of the local elites. The local elites becoming uh, their assimilation into the, uh, the new modern state, the new centralized state. For uh, Dina Huri, uh, for Arya Sazman, 18th century fiscal political system was a success. He, she, but, but, but in her mind is a decline uh, discussion. So, but for her, the 19th century attempts for centralization, which she conceptualizes as the formation of modern state in the Ottoman case, was a failure because of the fact that the new Tanzimat governors uh, were, were unable to maintain the coalitions that they have achieved during the uh, 18th century. So the story is all about, fiscal history of 18th and 19th century is all about, a, a transition from a, re, uh, from a decentralized system to a centralization system. So my concern here is, I mean, we should find, or at least I'm doing fiscal history, I should find a way of avoiding the centralization paradigm altogether. So by using the centralization paradigm, which means that we should also totally abandon the formation of modern state paradigm, all those theories, and uh, I mean, maybe benefit a lot from, which I'm, uh, I've been trying to do, from anthropological perspectives of state, uh, which are uh, emphasizing the everyday, the everyday relations, without referring to the central, central, uh, an institutional form of state, they are emphasizing the relations in everyday, in individuals, within local communities. So that's my, that's my answer. Uh, well, for example, I mean, there's a double misrecognition here. I mean, the, the, the picture we have uh, for 18th century is a decentralized one, and another picture for 19th century with a centralized, centralized one or centralizing one. There's a double misrecognition here. For the 19th century, in my last uh, recent article, I have demonstrated in a very detailed way uh, how the persistence of a privatized form of uh, tax collection, I mean, tax farming, uh, very similar way for the tax farming, the function of the tax farming in the 18th century, which has been described in a very detailed way by, by Salzman, uh, was a way of distributing or uh, uh, sharing the surplus, agricultural surplus of uh, peasant producers in all around the Ottoman Empire. So the key here is uh, appropriation of those surpluses and distribution or sharing, uh, partitioning of those surpluses I mean, uh, the, the germinal kernel here, the germinal self of, uh, center, the germinal uh, cell of Ottoman fiscal political system is, uh, in my analysis, the appro appropriation of the uh, surplus of small subsistence level peasant producers. So we are actually, while doing uh, the uh, in quotation mark, the so-called provincial history, in a, at least in fiscal, regarding fiscal issues, we are examining, we are analyzing, we are describing uh, different dispositions of how this fiscal political system in 19th century and also in 18th century too uh, f find different articulations. The time and uh, place, uh, special temporal specificities, different forms. So doing that different forms is doing uh, maybe in the old terminology doing uh, fiscal history. In my, in my, I'm. I have five more seconds, actually. Five minutes. Okay. So in my res in the, in the res research part of my uh, paper, uh, I'm, I'm going to concentrate on three issues, three episodes. Uh, one is, uh, let me use this right now at the end of my presentation. Okay. Uh, well, one is the performance of Ottoman uh, treasury throughout the 19th century. As you can see from this graph, uh, from 18... 30s, 1820s, 1840s, with the Tanzimat on until the, the beginning of the war, 1914, the, uh, the, the revenue of the central government, central treasury, increased in nom nominal terms about fivefold. And if you take into account the inflation, the performance is about three, uh, three and a half fold. So there is an Im uh, important, massive, uh, remarkable uh, performance success 
According to the uh, economic and uh, fiscal historians, Ottoman Empire in my theory, for example, so they are emphasizing this performance a lot, and I use this graph in, in my paper. My question is, how we are going to explain this remarkable performance in terms of understanding what's going on in any locality? Okay, so, for example, this type of uh, statistical data, anyone in uh, this graph, uh, does not tell us anything uh, in terms of what's going on in the everyday realm uh, in any village, in the Romanian provinces, in Anatolian provinces, in Arab provinces, in all parts of them, but it doesn't tell us anything about what's going on in terms of the politics, the nature of how that exploitation, appropriation of the surplus has been uh, transferred from one section of society <coughs> to another and then transferred to maybe Istanbul or other parts of the empire. So we have to avoid uh, the centralization paradigm altogether. It's, uh, it's, it, it conceals more than it reveals, I, uh, in my perspective. The second episode, the second issue, I'm picking up a couple of episodes. Uh, sometimes I call them anecdotes, uh, some stories, some problem issues from the Ottoman Empire. And I'm concentrating on those issues in order to uh, explain or expand my perspective. The second issue or episode that, that I'm going to focus on this paper is, uh, well, the a Reform Act introduced by uh, Ahmed Shakir Pasha, uh, the chief uh, governor of the Eastern Provinces during, during the Reform Era, during the Hamidian Era, uh, he introduced in, his, uh, in, the, in, the, in the provinces under his governorship, the six provinces of Eastern Anatolia, I mean, in 1896, a reform which would transform the tithe into a land tax based on acreage. Okay, so I mean the major tax, major source of revenue for the Ottoman government was during the late even during the late 19th century was a, a direct uh, produced tax, uh, and it, well, it constitutes about 20 or 30 or sometimes 40 percent of the total revenue of the central government. So the the, the pasha was introducing. A new tax, transforming that uh, produce tax, that tight, and he is trying to reform it, reshape it, and make it a property, almost a property tax, a land tax. And he uh, tried a couple of examples in Eastern provinces, and also Hussein Hilmi Pasha, another Pasha, he is the governor of the Romanian provinces, and during the early 20th century in 1903 or 1902. He introduced the very same act in some of the provinces of Romania under his governorship, and he achieved a lot of success in terms of satisfying the expectations of the ordinary villagers. But the government, the Minister of Finance, and the, the government uh, put an end to this new uh, ship, and they cancelled the whole uh, operation, and the tide remain, continued to remain the major source of income. So there is some kind of politics here. At the, at the, at the local level, at the, at, the, uh, at the everyday level, or at the total global, broader level. So that is about the social or, if you will, class nature of Ottoman fiscal political system. I mean, we are examining, we are observing, and we are analyzing, and also as historians, we are investigating and describing, describing the very uh, different dispositions of this very same and as an abstraction, Ottoman fiscal system in different specific historical uh, positions. The final uh, issue that I am going to uh, talk on is the introduction of income tax, again from 1905, 1906, and 1907. I'm going to tell the story of uh, its introduction, its application, and the opposition from the uh, wealthier sections of society in Erzurum and Eastern provinces. Uh, there are a lot of political uh, tension in Erzurum while the government introduced this, uh, this new taxation because the meaning of this taxation is the government is trying to at least some uh, bureaucrats within government or within the finance department are, they are trying to move, they are trying to shift the burden of taxation over from the shoulders of ordinary peasants to the wealthier sections of society and as you can imagine, as you can ex expect, uh, the, 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 the bureaucrats uh, pursuing such a reform failed. So I'm going to talk, focus on these three issues and uh, without avoiding the central state, I'm going to bring to the forefront the actors, the specific actors, the bureaucrats, the landlords, the merchants, the villagers, the specific tax collectors, the gendarmes, uh, by means of uh, complicating the picture, the story in terms of 
the number of uh, actual historical agents uh, and to use this method as a way of avoiding uh, all those uh, dichotomous conceptions, center, periphery, or uh, other. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nader. Uh, any questions? You're, you're, just you're always the first one. Sorry. Even that, the other <laughs> <thing>. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Valdir. Thank you for this uh, 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 presentation. I was wondering if we keep, as Mark suggested, thinking that the Tanzimat period, the 19th century, the Tanzimat and what followed also Hamidian, is, of course, a continuation of all the uh, centuries. Uh, of Ottoman uh, practice, and especially in uh, fiscal terms. Uh, in the so-called classical age, we have a mixture of both centralized practices and local practices for taking the tax. That is, for GCA, you have central agents, for Adeti Akram, <coughs> the sheep tax, but for the tithe, it's always collected uh, uh, locally. So I was thinking that this might be also a continuation, and then you showed us this graph. Yes. This this graph of the the, the, the growth of uh, the, the, uh, the, the 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 growing of the Ottoman uh, central revenue tax. And this is, I mean, this development is something that very interesting. Of course, we do not have suggestions for previous centuries. I don't know if. Shevket Pamuk has in his book for previous centuries, if this is a new research, but that would be interesting. This is something new. This is showing a growing fiscal bureaucracy for the central state. My question is, why the drop in the 1870s? Is it because Rumelia, uh, the Balkan provinces, uh, go national, or there is a well, it's still a Rumi East part. I mean, it's 1877-78, and it dropped. And then it dropped, yeah. yeah. So well, there are a lot of technical uh, dimension of that increases and drops. Uh, and for the post-1870s, uh, the, 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 the war with Russia and the, uh, the, 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 the Eastern question and the loss of all those populations and territories are very important. But I'm using this graph specifically because it, 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 at first look it may appear as if it's contradicting my argument against centralization paradigm. Okay, this is a way of which helps me to explore my position. I mean, but because while showing only while using only the uh, the, the, the uh, revenue of the central government, which is expressed in this graph, we are we have no idea about the uh, the share the proportion of the tax because tax farming system is a privatized form of iltizam is still the major form of tax collection in Ottoman uh, provinces. So to what extent, which part of which proportion, of what uh, proportion of the that uh, extraction remain in the hands of those local, uh, those local these local uh, merchants, tax farmers, uh, sometimes bureaucrats. It's very difficult actually in late 19th century to distinguish between the dif these different roles. Okay, sometimes those bureaucrats, sometimes those merchants, sometimes the local muftis, for example, are pe taking part in this auction so for uh, tax farming. So, I mean, uh, and also the Ottoman economy is growing, gross uh, domestic, uh, the size of Ottoman economy is growing, and to what extent, to what proportion of the revenue has been incorporated by the local, by the local, we have no idea, idea because of the nature of the data, uh, statistical, uh, fiscal data we have. Uh, there are a couple of uh, very important, useful uh, Turkish uh, dissertations on local fiscal issues, and they are all, the, the, all the major point they are uh, making is about the, the uh, difficulty of using those uh, local fiscal documents in 19th century. Another pro problem that you mentioned is, I mean, the pre 19th century and post 19th century. Is it possible to uh, compile uh, data? which covers two centuries or even more, the classical, is very impossible. But Shevket Pamuk, for example, as you mentioned, he is doing a comparative history 
global fiscal history in a very general way, and he is using this type of very general, mostly uh, uh, not very healthy, I mean, which has many problems. He is using those type of data to make a point, and that's very important, making a point and may not making a debate based on those topics, a way of uh, working, uh, trying to understand the differences, the transformations from 18th to 19th century is very useful, obviously, but uh, the data is not uh, sufficient to make generalizations. But my point is, I mean, in 19th century, I, uh, the persistence of fiscal uh, tax farming, now these tax farms are small. I mean, for example, before in 1820s, uh, the auctions, tax farming auctions in Istanbul, there are high level bureaucrats, about 230 individuals in some pashas and viziers, and a couple of uh, Galata merchants, mostly Armenian, and they are brokering, they are controlling the auctions, and they are subcontracting these auctions to uh, local governors. So there are levels of uh, sharing the total resources of the empire, which is actually a surplus of the ordinary small peasants. So here in late 19th century, my point is, Again, uh, all these fiscal instruments and tax, co tax collection at the everyday level in an anthropological way of, uh, in an anthropological understanding, as a social relation, an everyday relationship, it is still about, for example, a small merchant in a, in a cassava level or a village level. He's, whenever he gets the tax collection rights, the auction, then he is appropriating the surplus of the, uh, the ordinary person. And he is, Maybe sending some part of that uh, surplus to the to the governors, to the center of the province, or maybe to the Istanbul. So the problem is still what connects all those uh, localities, what connects all those differences, specific uh, histories, is the, this general fiscal political system. So my my point is trying to interlink the structural and institutional macro uh, perspective to uh, another uh, everyday anthropological perspective and. Uh, 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 comprehend that interlinkage as a, a subsumption uh, or overdetermination. So uh, this is a way of for me, at least I'm proposing, I'm playing with this conception, as a way of avoiding center versus periphery. So my point is, last time, let me, let me, this, let me, this, uh, let me say one more sentence. I mean, by turning our uh, lens from center to the province, or going back to the province and looking from, from province to the center, this type of playing with the, the metaphor of, of the optimal <coughs> lens is alone not, not uh, I mean, it, it doesn't, it could not help us solve these dichotomous conceptions. To avoid all these dichotomous conceptions, we have to get rid of the conception of the center and periphery, the province. So I found Marx, uh, uh, I mean, Mark's paper in terms of trying to give us an idea of discursive semantic meaning of province. So I'm doing much more I mean, uh, structural uh, issues, fiscal issues, so not much about fiscal, uh, discursive or semantic issues. Nadia, have you thought about the ideological implications of this conceptual and theoretical overhaul that you're trying to sort of I mean, what is, how does it relate to, for example, small business of nation state? Uh, well, I, I think there's that. I mean, at, at, the beginning of, at the beginning of my presentation, I emphasized the present contemporary condition of global capitalism. For example, in the 1960s, the condition is very different, which was informing historians' conceptualization. So right now, for example, criticizing all those historiographies may be very easy, but at a different time, different conditions of global capitalism. Developmentalism, for example, in 1960s and 70s. National, nationalism as a developmental project, for example. All those type of uh, ideologies inform historians. Right now, we are living under global capitalism, which is sh shifting our understanding of space structurally and also uh, ideologically. So all those shifts make uh, the meaning of nation and uh, province center very much uh, me meaningless. So we have to find new space, for example. I mean, we have to redefine the space, what we mean by space. Uh, and early modern historians, for example, are emphasizing using uh, transregional, transnational, transimperial, 
I like those kind of think, thinking, new approaches, but the problem, as I already mentioned, was I mean, they are mo mostly the early modernist historians, not uh, our friends here, and most of them are focusing on cultural issue, issues. Islamicate, for example. Islam is a sphere, uh, trans imperial, which includes Ottoman Empire, Mo post Mongolian Islamicate sphere. It's a cultural sphere, so they are, they are using this type of semi global spaces as an analytical basis of their analysis. But for the issues that we are talking right now, the fiscal issues, for example, those type of cultural uh, understanding of space is not much useful. So extraction, taxation, appropriation, uh, fiscal political uh, system, Ottoman fiscal political system, its transformations within time and space. So those type of uh, issues. So nationalism is not useful here, uh, in my short answer to your questions. Okay, thank you very much. I think we need to move on to our third paper of this session. My professor Salim Deringel is professor of history at the Lebanese American University. And of course, uh, uh, for many years, he was professor of history at Boazici University. So he's, uh, he, moved, <coughs> he moved from one center to yet another, the center here in Beirut. Um, no. Salim will be giving a paper called uh, Hussein Qasim Qadri, an exceptional Ottoman in the Ottoman twilight Why in the Arab lands. Well, I was a student at Boaz University. I'm a TA, technical TA of Salim Berlin. Is right now I'm TA, technical oh, TA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's good. Yeah, too right. I, sh I should have mentioned that about Nadir's biography. <laughs> which speech uh, would I use? Oh, this one. Okay. Yeah. Um, no. Wait, it's, it's actually, I think. Hussein Kazim, I want Hussein Kazim. No, you can write it up here, no? It's a PowerPoint. If you write it there, it should come up. There you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me see, there are two. This one, the big one. Yeah. No, he's looking for this one, this one. Yeah, this yeah. One. No, no, no. You have to project it to the Yeah, yeah. <coughs> okay, can I have. No, this is not it. This is not the one. It's the other okay. one. Still. This one? This one, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, so if you can just make it full screen for me, please. When you do F5, it usually works, but. Yeah, it's working. Perfect. Right. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank. Uh, you, can you what? Uh, can we hear? Yes. Uh, I would. Yeah, I would like to thank uh, uh, John Malloy and Abed for inviting me. I'm here among old friends uh, because I was at AUB for a short while, two years. Um, I'm also. I have a confession right off. I am a convinced and very proud document fetishist. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I'm the one who coined the phrase and Halil Bakht, I stole it from me. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, and what I'm going to, actually, the two talks I heard before came, it was very, uh, very useful because Mark's talk, particularly the, the person he talked about, the provincial turned Ottoman and the Ottoman turned provincial, pretty much describes my man here, Hussein Kazem, and in many ways an exceptional Ottoman in the twilight of the Arab lands. And by the way, uh, by way of uh, short, if I may, short advertising, this is a chapter, uh, his memoirs uh, translated by myself, uh, uh, is a chapter in the book that has just come out called The Ottoman uh, Twilight in the Arab Lands, which should be available as of in a couple of uh, months' time. It's hot off the press. So this is like a chapter in my, uh, in my book. So. Uh, now, of course, uh, the last years of Ottoman rule in Lebanon and Syria, uh, called the Ayyam Atrak, the days of the Turks, 
uh, as this, no, this is no news to this company, it has very negative connotations. Uh, it reminds people of the famine, the hanging of the martyrs, the Arab martyrs in uh, Burj Square, the reign of terror of Jamal Pasha, and so on. Now, this has been written on and commented on quite a lot by notable historians uh, such as uh, Leila Fawaz, the first name that comes to mind. But my question when I wrote this, when I began doing this research about this, I, I, I used five memoirs. Uh, how did the attack themselves see themselves in this context? Okay? Um, and of course, the other um, point that I tried to look at is um, this, my whole issue here is um, what was the relationship between the Turk and Arab? Okay, what was the relationship? On the one hand, these years uh, leading up to the, and during the war, there's a feeling, uh, even on the part of the most strident Arab nationalists, that uh, they might not like the Turks, in fact, they might hate certain Turks, like Jemal, but nonetheless, uh, the Ottoman Empire, even the La Merkaziya, the people in, in Cairo, the Ottoman Empire was, they knew, the last bastion against foreign domination. Uh, they knew that the, 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 the alternative was either French or British domination, and some of them thought that was a good idea, but many did not. The, this image, of course, is uh, Feirouz from the, uh, the famous uh, movie Safar Barlik. And if you watch that movie, I think you will share with me the idea that Feirouz should have acted stuck to uh, singing. She's not a very great actress. Uh, okay, so this is the other, this is what I've just been saying. Now, this uh, slide on the left I find very, uh, very uh, evocative. These are the students of the Idadi, the Lycée in Aleppo, spelling Watan, fatherland, with their bodies in 1908. Uh, and of course, I find it very, it's very cute. This little dot here, the dot on the noon is probably the officer. And, um, and, and these poor boys probably had to clean this whole cliffside of all of these rocks before they could pose for the photograph. And um, that's one of the images that I wanted to share. Now, as for Hussein Kazem, um, this gentleman, this is a picture of him uh, taken in his youth. He's, uh, in a way, he's a very, um, he's a, a young Turk. He's one of the founder members of the Committee of Union and Progress. So he's sort of uh, uh, the cohort of Talat, Enver, Jemal. He's right in there with them, okay? Uh, but unlike those boys, he comes from a very upper class bureaucratic family. His father is uh, Kadri Bey, uh, 11 years as Vali of Trabzon, a very well known Vali of Trabzon. And so uh, young Kazem, Kyan Hussein, grows up in elite bureaucratic circles in Istanbul. He is friends with the famous national poet Tefik Fikret, and he actually becomes the co editor of Tanin which, as you know, is going to be the official publication of the Committee of Union and Progress. Now, the aspect of him being a provincial turned Ottoman and an Ottoman turned provincial is this. Uh, when he's the value of Aleppo between 1910 and 1912, uh, he becomes something of a local figure to the point where the locals, some of the locals, the up-and-coming bourgeoisie, refer to him as Walina, our Vali. Uh, because he is seen as the protector of this new bourgeoisie and uh, the enemy, the avowed enemy of the old elite, the lands owning, I suppose you would call them Zuama class. And he, unlike most Ottoman high officials in the, in the Arab, I hate to say provinces, but they were provinces, I'm sorry, uh, spoke fluent Arabic. Okay? And this is, comes out in Babur. So he's, again, exceptional in that regard. Uh, and here we have a, this is from Keith uh, David Watampaw in his book, uh, Being Modern in the Middle East, where he devotes quite a lot of uh, space to this, uh, the incident called the Hussein Jasm affair, whereby there's a, there's a tussle between the up and coming local bourgeoisie of Aleppo and the old crowd, the old, uh, the old guard, so to speak. And Hussein Kazem is recalled to Istanbul because there's a telegram war going on between Aleppo and Istanbul. The local, uh, the old guard are asking for him to be recalled, and the locals are pressing for him to stay on. And so, on the this, in one of the trips back from Istanbul, he is meet is met at the station by a crowd of uh, well wishers, 
and there is a band made up of the local school children who serenade his arrival and he stops twice, <coughs> uh, he walks actually from the station to uh, his, his place of business and he gives two speeches in Arabic. Then he is recalled to Istanbul, as I said, uh, because of this, the, the traditional notability of the city uh, do their best to get rid of him and in the end they actually uh, win. I've seen some of these uh, telegrams, there, there's many, there's like a whole big fat file, like I said, document fetishism. And uh, they tell a very interesting story actually of the rise of this new elite in, in, in Aleppo and the resistance of the old elite uh, to them through the personage of Hussein Kazan. Okay, anyway, uh, meanwhile, his, uh, his uh, enemies in um, Aleppo actually win out, and he is uh, recalled to Istanbul. He is offered several other positions after that, but he declines, and he decides to settle in Beirut in 1913. Okay, so this is now the chapter that I am actually the most interested in in his life. Uh, there in Beirut, he settles down and writes. He begins to write these memoirs that are that uh, I have used, uh, and in these memoirs, he says some very interesting. He's very scathing in the self-criticism of Ottoman rule. It's very rare, actually. Of course, he's a. We have to take into consideration that by the time he writes his memoirs, they're published in 1934. He's an embittered old man, and so on and so forth. But still, this is what he says. From the very first day, I saw that the Turks who had ruled this land, being Syria, for 400 years had done, nothing for, had done nothing for it. All the locals wanted from us was justice. All the Turks had done was to rob it. In Syria, whatever sign one sees of civilization, the people owed this primarily to the French and more lately to the Americans. All the Syrians saw from the Turks was bad faces and bad words. So his experience here, he's actually talking about, in fact, Beirut. And by the Americans, he means very clearly, as we shall uh, see later on, uh, the Syria Protestant College. Okay, uh, he, his wife was actually born in Beirut, so they have a family connection. Her father, Ismet uh, Pasha, was the military commander here for 13 years. Uh, Hussein Kazem, when he arrives here with his wife, he decides he's going to completely withdraw from politics. He's going to devote himself to a life of the mind. He's a scholarly man. He's a man of uh, scholarly inclinations. And uh, they, they have uh, means, so he falls into a very classical bourgeois Beiruti lifestyle. They rent a home here in Beirut, and they rent another one up in Sofar for the summer. Uh, and he says here in the memoirs, I was able to make extensive use of the very rich libraries of the, of the great Jesuit fathers. So he befriends the, uh, the, the San Joseph, the people who are today the San Joseph uh, Jesuits, and he becomes friends with them. And of course, because many of them, the ones who are French, because they're enemy nationalists, nationals, have to leave during the war. But there are those of them who are Lebanese or German or Austrian, and they remain. So he, he, keeps, he keeps up his contact. He keeps up his contact with them, and he uh, uses the Bibliothèque Orientale uh, the Libre uh, here in, in Beirut. He also becomes very good friends with Howard Bliss, by the way, and that will actually uh, come up later on. On Ottoman rule in Lebanon, this is uh, again from the text. He says, although we, we even refuse to accept uh, petitions written in Arabic, the Americans and the French have uh, printing presses where they print excellent texts in that language. The Syrian youth, therefore, he says, when they see how advanced the French and the Americans are and how bad, you know, how, uh, how undeveloped un uh, we are, of course will uh, prefer their centers of learning, meaning San Joseph or uh, uh, Syrian Protestant College. As to the Muslims, all that tied us together was religion, but because of the ignorant and corrupt officials that were sent to Syria who oppressed them, even this religious attachment proved not to be enough and prepared the downfall of the empire. So these are actually very, uh, very rare uh, autocritique coming from uh, such a, somebody who has actually been valley of somewhere as important as Aleppo. Now, here we come to something that is very important and interesting, and this is a... Uh, this most, most remarkable achievement was to compile an encyclopedic work, Lubnan Mabais Ilmiya wa Al Sorry, we Turks butchered the Arabic language. 
published in August 1918, prepared under the due protection of the Mutasarruf Ismail Hakkı Bey, probably at the instigation of Hüseyin Kazım, who had very close relations with him. In this room is my dear colleague Abdurrahim Abu Hussein, who has done extensive work on uh, on, the, on this uh, on this volume together with uh, my other dear colleague Engin Akarlı. My uh, humble contribution is here, in, uh, in not in any way, to, uh, to 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 delve into this work as much as they did, but to provide it as a sort of background information about the Hussein Kazim. This gentleman here is uh, is uh, Ismail Hakkabe, the penultimate mutasarruf uh, of uh, of uh, Jebel Lubna. Okay, this this is a multi-authored work uh, comprising signed articles by Amer Arab, American, and Turkish authors, and it stands as an enigmatic piece of scientific uh, work. It covers a broad spectrum of, 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 of the Vilayet Beirut, the people, the geography, the religions. There's a, a plenty of photography, drawings, and so on. It's something, it has something like 20 chapters. Uh, my big question, of course, when I, uh, when I uh, thought about this, was this is, we're talking May 1918 here, right? A couple of months afterwards, uh, the Ottoman Empire is no longer going to be around. Right, we fit. It's August, uh, October 30th. End of story. Right. So this volume, or these two, in fact, there are two. There's one for Jebel Lubnan and there's one for Vilayet Lubnan. Uh, are are the, what in a sense a testimony, testimonial, of the last days of Ottoman uh, Ottoman presence here. Perhaps my dear friend Abed can uh, can help me with that afterwards in the Q and A period. Um, the editor, the other editor, together with Hussein Kazem, was Father Louis Sheikho, a Jesuit priest uh, who, in fact, had no reason to love the Turks because they were, uh, Hussein Kazem protected them to a certain extent from the wrath of Jamal Pasha because Jamal and Azmi Bey, actually, the governor here, wanted to exile them to Diyarbakir, okay, because they were pro French. Everybody knew they were pro French. So he. Um, interceded uh, and, and, and allowed them, uh, Jamal allowed them to stay. He also saved the library because Jamal wanted to transport the whole library to Istanbul, which would probably have meant its ruin. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a photograph here. Uh, this is Jamal and his crowd. It features in my book. Uh, the reason I chose this photograph is because, except for Hussein Kazim is not in this picture, of course, but it features five of the people who are, are in my in the book. This is Ali Fuat Erdan, the person I'm pointing to with the cursor. This is Jamal's number two military man. Uh, this is Küçük Jamal, uh, the one who replaces uh, Jamal when he leaves in December 1918. Sorry, actually. sorry. The cursor is not appearing. The cursor is not appearing. Ah, maybe sorry. Yes. Okay, well I'll show you. Jamal. Ali Fuat Erdal, Küçük Cemal, otherwise known as Mersinli. And this chap, the young guy inclining his head in the back, is the, uh, one of the people who uh, is featured in my, uh, in my uh, translations. OK. Uh, this is a, uh, here you can see Cemal Pasha's arriving in, uh, in Beirut uh, in, 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 in December 1914. He pays, uh, I believe, three visits to Beirut. Uh, maybe Tyler can help me with that. Um, and this is what Hussein Kazim has to say of Jamal's policies. Because of Jamal's cruel acts and oppressive policies, we had to leave that beautiful land, Syria. It would take volumes to tell the story of Jamal Pasha's excesses, and maybe then we can understand why we lost this land. Right. So there is a feeling of identification. We lost this land. On the famine, this is, uh, for, Tyler would probably help me with this also. He writes in the memoirs the following. I saw hundreds of people drop dead in the streets from hunger. I was also an eyewitness to the abandoning of villages and the scattering of populations. The beaches of Beirut were full of cadavers. But I do not know whether this was a deliberate policy of the government or the result of the extreme conditions of wartime. The reason why he's putting that caveat in at the end, because here he is, this is in the memoirs, but here he is talking to General, to, to Colonel Wyndham Deeds. Who is Wyndham Deeds? 
Wyndham Deeds is the uh, intelligence officer uh, who arrives here with, uh, with the British, British troops at the end of World War I. And they all call him in because he's one of the last Turks. To, there's like 800 Turkish families who are stuck here in Beirut when the army leaves, right? So it's like we're talking a couple of thousand people. And he intercedes, he tries to intercede with the authorities to find these people food, to find these people shelter, and so on. Ultimately to evacuate them, which is what happens. Now, this is from the memoir, and he is the only one who I've ever seen referring to Jamaat, explicitly referring to the famine, where he says, supposedly, to Hussein Kazam, that the people of the Jabal should be wiped out by hunger would be the greatest happiness for us. May the wretches perish, we will thus be rid of them. Okay? Now, however, very soon after this, in 1916, uh, 17, and right into 1918, uh, Jemal and Azmi Bey, the governor of, um, of uh, Beirut, and uh, Ismail Hakka, the uh, mutasarraf of uh, Jabal Lubnan, start opening up extensive soup kitchens to provide famine relief. Right, and this is a letter. This is a letter from Jamal Pasha to Istanbul, the Grand Vizier Halim Pasha, Said Halim. I calculated that until the next harvest, there is a need for at least 150,000 liras for the provisioning of the poor of Jebel Lubna. This sum can be raised by mortgaging the properties of the churches. The money thus raised will not be given to the Maronite Patriarchate, but will be put at the disposition of a special commission that will be appointed by the Vilayet of Beirut and will be used for buying grain from the army stores. Now, in these files, again, uh, my, my lovely documents, there are, there's a massive great file like this dealing with famine relief in, really picks up in 1917 into 1918, here and in, uh, in the, in the Jebel. This is the governor of Beirut, Azmi Bey. How much more time do we have? Um, you've got about 10 minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> This is Azmi Bey, the other great Azmi, the other great player of the, on the scene. He's saying, uh, again, from this is, as you can see, archives, right? Uh, for charity work, we are spending 10,000 liras a month. It is, without, it is without doubt that the population of the Jabal was more than 300,000 before the war. 45,000 of these have moved to Beirut. 50,000 have gone to Jabal Druz. This year, some 70,000 have died. I am feeding 60,000 people every day. Okay? Now, this is, uh, first of all, a very, really interesting uh, open sort of uh, window. Um, these, these monies, of course, are in, in uh, paper money. So it's, it's uh, actually very, uh, you have to think four to one, more or less. But nonetheless, here we have the Valley of Beirut, Right? openly saying that this year some 70,000 have died. All right? And the point behind this document is he is in competition with Ismail Hakka Bey for scarce funds that will be sent from Istanbul for famine relief. And what he's saying in these documents is that Ismail Hakka Bey is, is inflating his numbers in the Jebel because these people have all died already or they have come to Beirut and I am responsible for feeding them. Therefore, you should send me, implicitly, more money than you sent to uh, Ismail Akkabe. Right? So there's a competition between the two. Um, okay, now why? Right? Why did Jamal al-Safah suddenly decide to become a humanitarian and open up soup kitchens and, and uh, try to succor the poor and the starving? Uh, of Beirut and elsewhere, actually, uh, Damascus also. Now, the reason, according to Hussein Kazem, is the following. In the Le Temps newspaper in Paris, which had been deliberately sent to him, Jamal, it was stated that Jamal Pasha was destroying the population of Syria through hunger, and the paper stated, he will answer for this in the future. So, this was the reason for the Pasha's sudden change of mind and is beginning to appear as the protector of the weak. But it was already too late. The dead were dead, and the beaches of Beirut were full of cadavers of the, Leb of the Lebanese peasants. Okay, so what, what Hussein Kazim is saying here is that Jamal was undertaking all of this, and Azmi Bey and the others, with a view to the 
after the war. After the war. Now what come out, comes out from here, and others also, I mean, uh, like uh, even Enver, I didn't use it here because it was getting too long, Enver sends a similar telegram <coughs> saying, I'm sending 24,000 liras for the, uh, for the food and the, uh, for the support of uh, the poor and hungry of, of Syria, plus 2,500 liras specifically for the orphanage in Antura. All right. This was Jemal's, I'm sorry, Enver's telegram is dated, is dated uh, May 18th, 1918. All right. And that's only a couple of months before uh, the collapse, the big collapse. Now, uh, why? Um, I'll come to that finally, if I may. Now, Hussein Kazim witnesses the last days of the Turks in Beirut. Some 400 Turkish families are stranded here. He intercedes with the occupation authorities to provide a ship for evacuation because they're telling him, we don't have any ships. We're trying to evacuate our own troops from Egypt and so on. So finally, a ship was found uh, at the intervention of the French Jesuit fathers again. The French Jesuit fathers returned uh, after the war. And because he had helped them during the war, not them, but the other Jesuits, he is, um, he is uh, actually, they find him a ship and these thousands of Turkish families are able to be evacuated to Turkey. He then goes back to Turkey and he becomes a very strident um, opponent of Mustafa Kemal. Why? Because Mustafa Kemal attacks him in the famous Nutuk, this three-day marathon speech. He accuses him of not joining Ankara. Sorry? Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. He accuses of not joining Ankara. This is... Um, his, uh, him delivering this famous speech that listened to him for 36 hours. Uh, so according to Kazem, this Nutuk, very, very strong language, he says it's a masterpiece of lies and distortion. Shah Hisseru Kazm u Tahrif. This, no wonder that his memoirs were only published after his death in 1934, Hussein Kazem's. All right? And even then, in somewhat uh, abridged version, now, my big uh, question, I'd like to return to my question about the famine relief, about this book, uh, Jabal Lubnan, uh, or, uh, or Lubnan being published months before the uh, collapse or the, or the armistice uh, between the Ottomans and the others and, and, the, and, the, and the victors. I have a speculation, and I put this in the introduction, and um, I would like to maybe put it to all of you. You see, we always look at what happens here with the perspective of the Eastern Front. All right? We look at Turkey, we look at Palestine, we look at Syria, but we forget what is happening in the West, where the fate of the war is actually being decided. All right? we're, looking, we're talking here of the spring of 1918. You have to remember that the Ottomans fought tooth and nail in Palestine. There was no col general collapse until after 18th of February 1918, the Battle of Megiddo. They made the British pay for every kilometer that they took in Palestine, in blood, seriously, okay? So, my speculation, at this point it's only speculation, and that's what I said in the book, is the uh, Young Turks, Enver, and all of those boys are, are counting on the Germans winning. Because you have to remember that the Ludendorff offensive came this close to actually succeeding in the spring of 1918. What would have happened then? There would have been a negotiated peace. And remember, there's also been brest The Russians are out of the picture. Okay, there would have been a negotiated peace. And at this negotiated peace, the Turks or the Ottomans would have sat at the negotiating table as on the stronger side, okay, with the Germans and quite possibly negotiated back some of this territory here in the Arab provinces. My speculation, I may be completely wrong. Nobody would have remembered the Armenians. Nobody. Because that would, that would be the end of the thing. They would be on the winning side, right? And nobody would really worry too much about the people that Jamal hung here. Okay? So there would be a, a negotiated peace which might just have recovered some of the Arab provinces in this part of um, the empire. There's more supportive evidence on this, which I didn't use here, and I'm going to end with that. Right downstairs 
in the archives of this fine institution, there are documents of Howard Bliss. Uh, Howard Bliss, uh, on, uh, on the 11th of, or the 12th of uh, December 1917, when Jerusalem falls to the Allies and Allenby makes his famous march in, there is in the newspapers, in, in, uh, in here and in, 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 in the Levant Herald, whatever, he's saying, Jerusalem is redeemed, hallelujah, right? I've seen downstairs a document, a letter written by Howard Bliss to Jamal Pasha uh, in May 1918, saying, we really miss your excellency. You were so kind in your support and in your help for the college. We know that you are occupied with very many um, weighty matters of state, but please occasionally think about your friends in the college, and we hope to see you again. So, the good doctor, I'm thinking, I'm guessing, is saying, well, what if they come back, right? What if they come back? So, in May 1918, things are still up for grabs, okay? So that's what my document fetishism has led me to. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions? About Ambara Salam, actually, uh, in the in the translated uh, edited by Tarif, uh, she mentions that Azmi Bey did his best to to stop the ravages of the famine, and this is a woman who has absolutely zero love for Turks, as we all know, all right, for very good reason. I mean, Jamal hung her fiance. Uh, so uh, yeah, this is my my guess. And um, the other thing is that uh, the other thing is that again, I think. They're just thinking about, you know, after the war. I mean, they're thinking we're going to be held responsible for this, and we have to have we have to be at least able to show that we did make an effort. Yeah, I think priorities are also kind of key here too. You know, 1915, the priorities are very different from you know ruling over a, you know a society that's been in two years of famine in 1917. Um, so that may have shifted some of the sort of approaches that they've taken. Oh, yeah, definitely. Anyone else? I just have one remark. Uh, I, do, I do get using the Safar Berlin analogy, but because I have used this as a teaching tool for my modern history of Lebanon, 
1961 Safar Berlik movie and the Rahbani experiment is part of Fouad Shab's attempt to create a new brand of Lebanon. Of course. And all this, uh, and Le the Lebanese tend to believe this is what history was actually with Abdo and Abdo and all of these uh, stupid acting. And, uh, but it's a nice teaching tool and it does basically paint the Turks as oppressors. Yeah, yeah, and also, if I'm not mistaken, about the same time, there are plays put on stage here in Beirut showing this whole episode. Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's a very time-specific thing. And it's also, you have to remember, it's the golden age of Beirut in many ways. Yeah, you know, it's of course. The, the Fakhreddin plays as well. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Malik has a question. Uh, thank you, Salim Bey. I mean, I, I stand up and speak louder. Both. <laughs> no. Well, I'll try. I, I thought my voice carries. I think it will. Does. Thank you, Selim I mean, it is. It is. Uh, yeah. It was amazing. Quite remarkable. I mean, it, the <coughs> sheds. I mean, what you didn't say, maybe one should say it on your behalf, is that so far, I mean, the post-Ottoman period was witnessed from, let's say, either Istanbul or the Arab tribes. Now here we have. The, the Ottoman view on the, on Syria, or, or you know, or through Turkish eyes, you know, those who became Turkish later on, and this is extremely important. So, um, because that is rare. I mean, you know, like and later on, most most of the memoirs by military men who remained in the in the career as career officers, the the memoirs were doctored. So that's also the importance of the memoirs of. Uh, the, the significance of the memoirs you highlighted in your, in your presentation. I mean, I, I, found it, I found it very fascinating. I mean, it answers your, your how to say, the concept of our workshop. I mean, it's, it's not centered, it's, it's actually inverting the perspective. Or the, 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 it, was, it was, yeah, I, mean, I, was, I was fascinated, I, mean, I may say. Coming from, coming from you, I was expecting the barbed question at the end, but it didn't come. <laughs> Anyone else? No? Any? No? Maybe, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the text of Hussein uh, and Patrick. I mean, other people have worked on it before. Uh, well, with all memoirs, I mean, how reliable are memoirs? I mean, they're not, they, we don't even pretend they're objective because they're memoirs. Uh, it's been published, this, the edition I used is a very, a very good one. Uh, it's been edited by Ismail Kara, a very well-known scholar of the late Ottoman period. It was published by Dergah, again, a respectable uh, publisher. It was, it was published for, for the first time in the 1930s as a tefrika, as a sort of uh, uh, piece by piece publication in the Dunya or Aksham, one of the, either Dunya or Aksham newspapers. Uh, as I said, it's, it was published after his death because of his very anti-Kemalist views. Uh, and it was also, I think it was also published uh, as, a, as a book earlier in the 1980s by Iletishim. It came out, there's an Iletishim edition. But that was not a annotated publication. The one that Ismail Karaz is a is a very good annotated uh, uh, because he doesn't play with the language. The Iletishim one tries to you know make it like modern Turkish or whatever. I hate that. Uh, he just it's a, a very good transcription. Ah, in fact, now that you mention it, there are actually two versions. He publishes the first the first one, not publishes. He writes the first one in 1929. All right. And then, uh, after that, the Nutuk appears. Uh, and and in, the, in the Nutuk, there, there are three places where Hussein Kazem is attacked personally by Atatürk. And the second version in 1930 is written specifically as an answer to the Nutuk. And that's where he says nasty things about. Uh, you know. <coughs> yeah. Sorry, but who wasn't criticized in the Nutuk? I mean, how did he wasn't criticized? I mean, almost everyone who was not on Atatürk's side was criticized. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's an excellent article by Hülya Adak about yeah. this, you know. Uh, and in fact, also, you, uh, Zürcher, has written about Hüseyin uh, uh, Kazım Karabekir's memoirs. He calls them the anti-Nutuk, right? 
he had enough time to criticize everyone. And he had a whole, he had a whole uh, secretariat at his disposal. First of all, uh, what I feel is after listening and uh, watching Selim Dering's presentation, it was it's a shame on me because many years ago uh, I was uh, teaching him and his technical assistant. He moved far away as compared to my presentation in terms of technical uh, side of presentation. He's so, so successful in terms of using PowerPoint. Uh, <laughs> anyway, but, but I, I had help. I had help. <laughs> Okay, uh, I mean the concept province, uh, I'm just uh, remembering uh, Mark's uh, presentation uh, and his, uh, his point on the semantics of the province in, in 19th century, uh, the discursive constitution of province as a conception in 19th century. So which reminds me uh, when, I mean, when we are listening to Selim's presentation, uh, I mean, the meaning of province in 1960s and 1970s, and even right now, is uh, quite extent very different. So, I mean, in the historiography of this term, uh, it's changing meaning throughout the last couple of 30 years, uh, decades. Uh, is also there is, I mean, it's changing a lot. So we, it's, it's difficult to assume that the conception, the terminology, the term province has the very same meaning. Uh, in historiography from 1980s to our present. So we have to think a lot on, because I'm making this comment because after listening Malik's uh, comments on Sitting uh, presentation, uh, I mean, in terms of what, what, he, what the, the story is telling us uh, is quite enlightening in terms of understanding the very dynamic relationship between how the central rule elite uh, before the war, sees the Arab lands and what the Arab lands sees the Ottomans. So, I mean, we have to think because the, the, the main agenda of this uh, workshop is I mean, there is a part, conceptual part in your agenda how to re redo uh, provincial history. We cannot avoid province, it's very clear, but it is, we have to be aware of the fact that this meaning is changing in right now uh, because the space itself is changing a lot. I mean, the space is national in 1960s and 1970s. It's now semi-global, for example. So the province is a very different thing right now, conceptually. So this is my small reminder. Uh, Pascal? So I, I very much enjoyed how your talk points out the contingencies and the way things happen and the fact that things could have taken a very different turn even at a very late stage compared to how we used to think about World War One. Um, what I'm wondering is, are there more ideological or political implications? Is one of the things that you're saying implicitly, in other words, you know, the, the empire could have held on to this province, and if so, what would the consequences have been? Well, that comes under uh, <laughs> that comes under soothsaying. <laughs> so, and aren't all historians a bit soothsayers? Yes. Uh, it's difficult to say. Uh, my guess is, again, very wild. Uh, they would have probably have to give up Medina, despite the fact that they fought until you know ten, a few months after the armistice. Uh, I suspect that they would have done their best to hold on. I don't know about Beirut, but they would have done their best to hold on to the to Aleppo. Because you have to remember that uh, Mustafa Kemal, the Seventh Army, actually managed to stop uh, the British flood only just, just uh, north of Aleppo. So the map that they took with them, uh, the Misaka Milli, the map uh, that was supposed to be the borders of uh, modern-day Turkey, the, the map they took with them to Lausanne, included Aleppo and Mosul and uh, Kirk. Uh, of course, they didn't get it. Right? I mean, they, it, was, it was a bargaining. It was a bargaining position. It was a bargaining position, and uh, they didn't. They didn't make it. But that map is very interesting because it very clearly includes Aleppo within the t territory that they claimed as part of uh, as part of the, the new Turkey to be. 
Um, ideologically, of course, we are very much dominated by the Kemalist discourse of, and this is, I try to, I, I, I mentioned this in the book, you know, what I call the good riddance syndrome. The Arabs were glad to be rid of them. You know, we're glad to be rid of them. We're now modern, we're now secular, we're now Turkish. You know, that, that of course, is a discourse that develops later, actually in the 30s, the beginning of the 30s. Um, and reaches its peak, interestingly enough, as a sort of response from the other side, these Turks, da da da, uh, in, interestingly enough, during the crisis of Alexandretta in 1938, with the, uh, with the actual illegal seizure of, of uh, Alexandretta province, or, or Sanjak, by the Turkish forces in collusion with the French. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's very much an ideological position, and it's a discourse that is determined very much ex post facto after the war, after, every, after everything's done and finished. Thank you, though. Yes? Okay. Uh, a comment on the general discussion. Uh, except, apart from the fact that I'm also a document fetishist, a lot of us, I'm also a local history fetishist. I mean, I started as an Ottoman historian, so local history, like cyphrology, Greek studies, or, were like, but reading the Ottoman sources, I understood that it was very much local history. Uh, it might be provincial, with the majority uh, and this kind of historiography, but it makes a lot of sense if you are trying to see the facts and get your facts straight uh, in different parts of the Ottoman Empire. The imperial logic is right, but when you're in a place either Lebanon, Greece, Bulgaria, you have to know the local language, the local sources, the local uh, way of uh, thinking. And I think this is uh, pretty much what uh, Selim Hoja uh, did to play between uh, the two. And finally, to, to, to understand th things locally, uh, well, of course, there are the borders of the beginning of the 20th century, what we described, which made us think that oh, the Ottomans are, and even before, are bad, in the middle center, what, so, then the, uh, the imperial perspective became a very uh, bad thing and we went local. Uh, our localism actually is an Ottoman cultural tradition to think locally. It's not, uh, it, it comes from the Ottoman Empire. It was an empire, a series uh, of local uh, identities, people, uh, and stuff. It makes not a lot of sense except we are talking about coffee or, or food or things like that, to think that the Ottoman Empire and its border were a homogeneous uh, 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 space or a cultural uh, entity. Just to, uh, for the discussion. Actually, just a quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I also had a quick, a quick question. In one document that uh, Selim Deligi showed us. Uh, this, I mean, this also points to a debate or argument that may, may, may occur also amongst ourselves with regard to uh, whether. I mean, it goes back to the kind of differentiation between the the material. The economy and the, and the social, as opposed to the cultural. Uh, Nadir Uzbek made the argument that the, the, the fiscal political system uh, should be understood, if I, if I got you right, uh, in its own terms, so to speak. That is to say that the, the elements of ideology that could be approached on, on a different level sh would not tell us much about how the, the, the fiscal system actually worked, uh, which would actually be a, a kind of a response to your argument. I mean, 
whatever, however localist the, 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 the culture of the Ottoman Empire, the culture promoted by the, the Ottoman elites themselves everywhere uh, could be maybe the way the, the fiscal organization worked was a kind of different, uh, for different principles. That could be a possibility. But then my also, my objection to that would be that why should we kind of oppose this cultural understanding of the empire to the, let's say, infrastructural uh, organization in the first place? I mean, I, 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 can, I can think of, of a fiscal system that is not carrying and, and conveying a cultural conception of society in and of itself. So the opposition, again, sounds, sounds a bit uh, uh, like a, at, at the first approximation, it, it's useful and then it's also useful to, to, of course, sources are not encouraging, I mean, you know, tax registers are maybe not providing a lot about how the Ottoman uh, financial people thought of the world, let's say, what, what, what the world, their world view may be, and their, their documents are, are not very, uh, not very uh, speaking very much about that. But still, the, it's kind of incumbent on us to, to try and, and go beyond the, the separations that we should think of building uh, or we should using uh, as a kind of temporary tool uh, I guess maybe maybe you're not agreeing with that. But, uh, my position would be close to that. Well, I, if I'm not mistaken, I totally agree with you because while I'm emphasizing the fiscal and uh, social, maybe uh, that's because I'm doing fiscal history. And I mean, in terms of the local, the specific, the actual, the everyday, the different, the difference. I mean, that difference, that specific, that locally includes sports, cultural, social, and all those uh, different dimensions. I'm not hierarchizing. I mean, I'm not preferring one. I'm not putting one above the other. The totality of all those levels or dimensions uh, is very important. So, for example, your study, which I found very uh, important, I mean, you are uh, examining the discursive semantic construction of the, the, the province, provincial. So, it's very, I found that very important. So. I mean, I'm not putting the social and physical above cultural, but the point that I was trying to make, make while I'm presenting my paper is, for this semester, I'm teaching a course on Ottoman historiography, where it has been, uh, and where, where it has been coming and where it's going, something like that. I'm reading a lot on the recent literature on the early modern era in Ottoman historiography, and in that literature, in that, in that new scholarship, I saw a lot of emphasis on Islamic, cultural, religious issues, uh, and they are, uh, I mean, they are defining that new space, this new semi-global, semi-global space, post-Mongolian space, in a, I mean, to, to a great extent ignoring the social, economic, fiscal dimension, uh, I'm just uh, arguing against that emphasis, which are, I mean, the, 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 the emphasis that they are putting on religious, cultural identity, as opposed to, for example, Islamic sphere versus uh, Chinese Asian sphere versus Christian, uh, let's uh, agree, I mean, uh, they are dividing the world around culturally different spaces, semi-global spaces. I have some uneasiness with that type of uh, the vision of the world, the split world history, global history, so my argument is just against the most type of history. Otherwise, for example, specific text collection <coughs> as an administrative practice in a given locality, in Erzurum, for example, or in Cyprus, or in Corfu, for example, at a given time, in 1890s, for example, or earlier. So they are totally different. So how we are going to explain that difference? Obviously by paying attention to very social and cultural and those are proficient, so I'm not, uh, I mean, I couldn't express in a very clear way my position while presenting my paper regarding this very issue. So I, I totally agree with you. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah Mark? My question about, about this actually has to do with, with this as well, because I was thinking about the, 
the way we, we try and, and figure out uh, how much money, for instance, the, the, the Ottoman tax collection system gathered at a given period is one thing. The way the sources that the Ottoman chancery system made available for us through their registering uh, practices in a, is another one. So we, we, again, to understand the registration patterns, we need to get a, an understanding of something that has actually little to do with the, the practice of collecting taxes itself. I mean, there, there is this kind of separate levels of culture, let's, let's say. And th this goes to, the, to the, this uh, Lugnan encyclopedic uh, work that you mentioned, uh, Céline de Lugid. Uh, I was wondering whether it, it doesn't have much in common with the Salname uh, kind of um. compilation practices, even, even to the point that it's, it's published under the the authority of the Mutasarif, actually, uh, so which means that it's kind of uh, uh, conveying a certain official uh, value as an almanac of a given provincial uh, pro setting in, in, the, in, the, in the empire. Uh, yes and no. I mean, it certainly, uh, certainly builds on the Salname tradition. But the Salnames, as you know, were supposed to be published every year or every so often and updated. This goes much beyond that. I mean, it goes much beyond that. I mean, in the introduction, uh, Hussein Kazim actually uh, writes the introduction to the uh, Lubna volume, where he, he points out the reason for this being published. And, it's, and he's saying, we're doing this, we're carrying out this work for the purposes of making Lebanon known to itself and making Lebanon, Lebanon, he means the, you know, Beirut, sorry, he means Beirut, uh, to the outside world. So it's, it's, a, it's a document very much for posterity as well. So it builds on the Salnami tradition, certainly, but first of all, it's much more uh, voluminous. It's two volumes and they have everything from, you know, the ideal, you know, sort of the classical, you know, the, the, the classical photograph of the Druze, or the classical photograph of the Mennonite, or, you know, uh, two, two modern things like um, a machine for delousing clothes, a machine that you put your clothes into to get rid of the lice, all right, or modern firefighting equipment, uh, this sort of thing. It's in a line, it's in a sense in, in line with a, a, a much more expensive and glamorous version of it would be, I suppose, now that I think about it, would be Abdul Hamid's albums that he uh, had compiled, these, uh, these massive, great, high-quality uh, photographic albums that he sent to various uh, prestigious libraries around the world, the idea of, of a self-portrait. Okay, I think that's, it's, it's in that tradition also. But it's certainly more, it's certainly much more detailed and compendious compared to the Salnami. Tarif ve coğrafi lugatı. Yeah, that, that it's more in that tradition also. It's more in that tradition. Uh, yeah. Tyler. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
contributed an article on, um, on schools, on education, of course highlighting the Jesuit schools, and that was actually censored because they, it was too pro-French. So, so they, they took out all the pro-French bits. And, you know. But Shehu, of course, as I said, they have no reason to love the Turks. I mean, they, 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 made, them, they made their life hell. Right? But because Hussein Kazem was in such good terms with them, Shehu actually accepted to become one of the editors uh, of the uh, of the volume. Well, I think... Um I think we've kind of exhausted ourselves. I understand that there's uh, refreshments waiting for us outside. So all the discussion of famine and misery <laughs> can be alleviated by some sustenance. So thank you very much for attending. And um, it's time for a cup of coffee. Thank you very much.